Assalamu alaikum doctors. So now let's talk about the causes of primary amenorrhea. So actually it is the continuation of the first video where we had discussed the general overview of the amenorrhea and here in this lecture we will be more dealing with the causes of primary amenorrhea exclusively. So let's understand the primary amenorrhea. What is primary amenorrhea? As you know that the normal age for the menarche that is around about 13 year. So if the females fail to have their menarche by age of 16 although they have a normal growth and normal secondary sexual characteristic. Already we discussed it previously. So this is called as primary amenorrhea. Before coming toward the causes it is important that we have a general concept of HPO axis which is important. So let's understand the concept of HPO axis what is HPO axis? Now HPO axis stands for the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. So in this condition what happens say this is a hypothalamus. Let's suppose this is a hypothalamus. This hypothalamus it releases a specific hormone by name that is called a GnRH which stands for the gonadotrophic releasing hormone. This gonadotrophic releasing hormone it acts on the anterior pituitary gland. It acts on the anterior pituitary gland. As you know that the pituitary gland consists of two lobes, anterior lobe and posterior lobe. So from the posterior lobe of pituitary gland it releases the ADH which is also called vasopressin and it also releases the oxytocin. Well from the anterior lobe of pituitary gland it releases various hormones in the form of prolactin and the form of growth hormone which is also called somatotrophic hormone. It also releases the thyroid stimulating hormone. It releases the adrenocorticotrophic hormone and it releases the follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So from the posterior lobe of pituitary gland it releases the ADH plus oxytocin while from the anterior lobe of pituitary gland it releases the prolactin, growth hormones, thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenocorticotrophic hormone, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Here we are going to concern with only two hormones that is follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Soon as when GnRH act on the anterior lobe of pituitary gland so it releases the FSH and LH from the anterior lobe of pituitary gland. So this FSH and LH it act on the ovary it act on the ovary. Now ultimately ovary produce the estrogen. Ovary produce the estrogen. Once ovulation occur progesterone is secreted. Progesterone get secreted. So once ovulation occur progesterone secreted this estrogen and progesterone it act on the uterus. and from the uterus the menstrual blood comes out. So initially hypothalamus release the GnRH ultimately it acts on the anterior lobe of pituitary gland from anterior lobe it release the FSH and LH FSH and LH act on the ovary and ovary produce the estrogen once ovulation occur progesterone is secreted this estrogen plus progesterone it act on the uterus through which through uh, uh, from uterus the menstrual blood comes out. Now this whole axis is called as HPO axis that is stand for the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. Now this HPO axis it is very important and for the mens for the normal menstruation it is important that this HPO axis should be well coordinated. By any means if there is defect occur in any endocrine gland out of hypothalamus pituitary and ovary so what happens that the normal menstruation will be disturbed. So in that condition there is defective menstruation and the female are there is absence of menstruation as we discuss it in the case of primary amenorrhea. So in this HPO axis the endocrine glands that which is important to for the intactness of the function that is hypothalamus and there is pituitary gland and ovary and uterus. So for the normal menstruation it is important that hypothalamus, pituitary gland, ovary 
and uterus it should be working normally if any of endocrine gland out of these uh, hypothalamus pituitary or uterus or ovary if they are defective so in that condition it lead to the case of primary amenorrhea so hopefully you will get the concept of hpo axis now let's talk about the main our topic that is causes of primary amenorrhea so let's understand the certain causes of primary amenorrhea so we divide the causes of primary amenorrhea in a compartment basis so the primary amenorrhea causes the primary amenorrhea causes it is classified into four compartments in order to understand good and well the causes of primary amenorrhea is divided into four compartments the compartment 1 the compartment 2 compartment 3 and compartment 4 so in the compartment 1 we have a uterus there is uterus and a compartment 2 there is ovary and a compartment 3 there is pituitary gland and in the compartment 4 there is hypo telemas so what are the causes of the primary amenorrhea which are related to uterus we will be discussing each of the cause of uh, dead condition in a comprehensive way and then we will be uh, move toward the certain uh, ovarian causes which lead to the primary amenorrhea and so far further up to pituitary gland and hypothalamus so what are the causes of primary amenorrhea which are related to the uterus so the first condition in the compartment 1 that is called as mullerian agenesis it is called as mullerian agenesis which is also called as mrks syndrome MRKS syndrome means Meyer Rokitansky Koster Hauser syndrome so in the uh, in the first compartment there is a condition mullerian agenesis or which is also called Meyer Rokitansky Koster Hauser syndrome it can lead to the primary amenorrhea while the second condition is testicular feminization syndrome testicular feminization syndrome now it is also called androgen insensitivity syndrome and don't forget the point that in the mullerian agenesis the chromosome number is 46 xx while in testicular feminization syndrome or androgen insensitivity syndrome here the chromosome number is 46 xy so don't forget the point while in the compartment 2 the certain ovarian causes which lead to the primary amenorrhea it consists of the the first one is the most common cause is turner syndrome and the another uh, condition is pure gonadal dysgenesis and there is swear syndrome and there is save syndrome which is also called resistant ovarian syndrome so in the compartment 2 what are the ovarian causes that lead to the primary amenorrhea it consists of turner syndrome pure gonadal dysgenesis severe syndrome and savez syndrome which is also called resistant ovarian syndrome now what is the chromosome number in the turner syndrome so that is 45 x0 so in the turner syndrome the chromosome number is 45 x0 while well, in pure gonadal dysgenesis the chromosome number is 46 xy and in the severe syndrome the chromosome number is 46 xy as well so these are the ovarian causes which which lead to the primary amenorrhea now in the compartment 
Three, there is pituitary gland. So what are the causes of primary amenorrhea which is related to the pituitary gland? So it consists of the, the first condition is called as craniopharyngioma. Craniopharyngioma. And the another condition is chiri fromil syndrome. So what are those two conditions of primary amenorrhea which is related to pituitary gland? That is craniopharyngioma and chiri fromil syndrome. While in the compartment 4, there is a hypothalamus. So what are the causes which are associated with the hypothalamus? It consists of the first is Kalman syndrome. Kalman syndrome. Lauren syndrome, there is Kalman syndrome, Lauren syndrome and Frohle syndrome. Now we will be discussing each of uh, each cause of primary amenorrhea in detail. So it is worth noting what are the causes of primary amenorrhea. The causes of primary amenorrhea is divided into four compartment wise. Now compartment one consists of uterus. So what are the causes of primary amenorrhea which is related to uterus? That is Mullerian agenesis which is also called meyer rokotansky koster hauser syndrome which is also called MRKS syndrome. And don't, for the, don't forget the point what is the genotype of the Mullerian agenesis that is 46XX while the second condition is testicular feminization syndrome which is also called androgen insensitivity syndrome and what is the genotype for the testicular feminization syndrome that is 46XY. Now coming toward the second compartment the, the, uh, it consists of Turner syndrome the genotype is 45X zero and another is pure gonadal dysgenesis the chromosome number is 46xy and there is severe syndrome the chromosome number is 46xy and there is severe syndrome which is also called resistant ovarian syndrome while in the compartment 3 there is craniopharyngioma and chiri from a syndrome and in compartment 4 there is kalman syndrome laurin syndrome frohle syndrome we will be discussing all those causes uh, as a respective compartment in a detail. Now let's understand. Now there is another question that which is the most common cause for the primary amenorrhea. So the answer to the question is that is a Turner syndrome. So which is the most common cause for the primary amenorrhea? So that is a Turner syndrome. The another question is which is the most sec which is the second most common cause for the primary amenorrhea? So that is a Mullerian agenesis. So this is the most common cause for the primary amenorrhea. The second most common cause for the primary amenorrhea is Mullerian agenesis. Which is the third most common cause for the primary amenorrhea? That is a testicular feminization syndrome. So please don't forget the point. The most common cause is Turner syndrome, Mullerian agenesis and testicular feminization syndrome. So that's all about the general uh, overview of the causes of primary amenorrhea. Now we will be discussing uh, each cause in a compartment wise. So the first compartment that is consists of the uterus. So let's understand the concept of the Mullerian agenesis. Now the in a compartment one compartment one it consists of uterus. So the cause of primary amenorrhea which is related to uterus, the first is that is called as Mullerian agenesis. Mullerian agenesis which is also called as MRKH syndrome. Now this is one of the same thing. What is MRKH syndrome? MRKH syndrome stands for the Meyer Roketansky Castor Hasser syndrome. So Mullerian agencies are MRKS syndrome. MRKS syndrome stands for the Meyer Roketansky Castor Hasser syndrome. So in Mullerian agencies, there is absence of formation of the Mullerian duct. It means the Mullerian duct will be absent. Mullerian duct formation is absent. 
so as a result of this the vagina and uterus they are underdeveloped or they are absent although the female have a normal external genitalia in this case so the mullerian duct formation is absent in this condition and thus vagina and uterus are underdeveloped are absent although female had normal external genitalia so in mullerian agenesis the mullerian duct formation is absent thus vagina and uterus are underdeveloped although the female have a normal external genitalia so the most important point is that which is the chromosome number what is the chromosome number for the mullerian agenesis condition so in these patients in these conditions the chromosome number is that is 46 xx so what is the genotype for the mullerian agenesis that is 46 xx as you know that the sex of the baby it is determined by y chromosome it is not determined by the x chromosome and it is the s it is the the sex related region on y chromosome it is present on the sry gene which is responsible for making the testes so if there is two s chromosomes so likely the the, the gonads will be differentiated into the ovary if there is xy chromosome the gonad will be likely differentiated into the testes so if we see the condition of mullerian agenesis here the chromosome number is 46 xx it means there is two s chromosome if there is two s chromosome the gonads will be likely differentiated into the yes that is ovary now it means the here the ovary is normal it is derived from the genital ridge and it's normal if the ovary is normal so it means it will produce the estrogen it will produce the estrogen and if the ovary is normal so it means the estrogen will be an adequate amount and as you know that estrogen is responsible for the secondary sexual characteristic if the estrogen level is adequate so it means that the secondary sexual characteristic in these patients are normal so this is the concept that in these females the secondary sexual characteristic are not getting affected they are normal now the another point is that and these these females can't menstruate these females these females can't menstruate and why it is so because of the absence of because of the absence of the mullerian duct so these females can't menstruate because of the absence of mullerian duct and in mullerian agenesis there is absence of mullerian duct and what is the uh, this this mullerian duct it helps in the formation of the female reproductive system it it helps in the formation of fallopian tube it helps in the formation of the uterus it also helps in the formation of upper part of vagina while the lower part of vagina it is derived from the urogenital sinuses so the mullerian duct it helps in the formation of fallopian tube it helps in the formation of uterus plus upper part of the vagina while the lower part of vagina is derived from the urogenital sinuses now look if there is uh, absence if in mullerian agenesis there is absence of mullerian duct so what happens that ultimately the fallopian tube will be absent in these conditions the uterus will be absent in these patients and the upper part of vagina will be also absent in this condition if the uterus is absent in these conditions so it is very obvious that there will be no menstruation and that's the reason that these females can't menstruate why why these females can't menstruate because of the absence of the uterus as mullerian duct helps in the formation of fallopian tube uterus and upper part of vagina so if the mullerian duct is absent so truly speaking the uterus will be also absent so the females can't menstruate in this condition now ideally speaking if the females uh, if uh, in this condition if the mullerian duct is absent so what happens if the mullerian duct 
is absent so ideally speaking the fallopian tube uterus and upper part of vagina should be absent but it is in certain cases it is documented that the distal part of the fallopian tube it so there is a question uh, mrks syndrome is characterized by all except mrk h syndrome is characterized by all except option a absent fallopian tube absent uterus absent vagina and absent ovary so as you know that and Mullerian agenesis, the, there is uh, the, the Mullerian duct formation is absent and Mullerian duct helps in the formation of fallopian tube, uterus and upper part of vagina. So if the Mullerian duct is absent, so it means the fallopian tube will be absent, the uterus will be absent and upper part of vagina will be absent. So in MRKS syndrome, it is characterized by all except absent fallopian tube, absent uterus, absent vagina and absent ovary. So the answer to the question is that is absent ovary. Now there is a, another important question that uh, MRKS syndrome and 20% cases it is documented that it is associated with the renal system. It means in 20% case it helps in the formation of uh, renal system. So Mullerian duct helps in formation of renal system and 20% case so it means and mullerian agenesis if mullerian duct is absent so it means the formation of renal system will be impaired so in that condition there will be a horseshoe shaped kidney so in mrks syndrome which clinical sign is seen in the renal pathology that is horseshoe shaped kidney and it is also documented that in 12 percent case it is associated with the skeletal functional so if Mullerian duct is absent, so there will be abnormalities occur in the skeletal function which lead to the aphase of scoliosis. So MRKS syndrome is associated with the horseshoe shaped kidney plus it is associated with the scoliosis. So students, that's all about the MRKS syndrome which is also called as Mullerian agenesis. Now, how you will treat the patient of Mullerian agenesis? Let's discuss the management of the Mullerian agenesis. Management of Mullerian agenesis patient. So it is obvious you can't make these females menstruate and why it is so because of the absence of the uterus and that's the main reason that the menstrual function it is not restored in this condition so you can't make these females menstruate and why it is so because of absence of uterus and that's the reason the menstrual function is not stored but yes you do vaginoplasty and the vaginoplasty you can do vaginoplasty and the MRKS syndrome so in vaginoplasty actually what is a vaginoplasty it is a surgical procedure through which vagina is created and the vaginoplasty it is a definitive management it is the definitive it is the definitive management for the Mullerian agenesis now there is an another question when we do vaginoplasty vaginoplasty is done just before the marriage so vaginoplasty it is done just before the marriage now there is a there is an another question 
what are the techniques through which vaginoplasty is done. So there are a lot of techniques through which vaginoplasty is done, but yes, there are two main uh, techniques through which vaginoplasty is done. The first one is MC endoid technique and William vaginoplasty. So the techniques through which vaginoplasty is run that is MCU endoid technique and William vaginoplasty. Now in certain females their, they had a, uh, their size of vagina is round about 1 centimeter. So in certain females the vagina size is 1 centimeter. So in that condition we use the frank dilators. And remember the point that these frank dilators, it, it is not a definitive management. It is not definitive management. And these frank dilators, it increase the size of the vagina. And already we discussed in MRKS syndrome that here the number of the estrogen level, it is quite high. So the level of estrogen is adequate and that's the reason we can't do ERT in this condition. ERT stands for the estrogen replacement therapy. therapy. So in this condition, uh, estrogen replacement therapy is not done. And why it is so? Because the level of estrogen, it is also educate it is high so we can't do ERT now there is an another question how you would calculate the number of bar bodies and the uh, MRKS syndrome so the number of number of bar bodies so the number of bar bodies is calculated by the number of X chromosome <coughs> sorry the number of X chromosome minus 1 so as you know that and the uh, Mullerian agenesis are in MRKS syndrome, the, the genotype is 46XX. So it means the number of X chromosome in this condition is 2. So you would put 2 in the place of here. So the number of X chromosome will be 2 and that is minus 1. So the answer is 1. So the number of bar bodies in the MRKS syndrome that is 1. So student that's all about the uh, first cause in the compartment that is called as Mullerian agenesis which is also called MRKS syndrome stand for the meyer rokitansky koster hauser syndrome. So hopefully you will get the first cause in the compartment uh, that is Mullerian agenesis. Now let's discuss the another cause of primary amenorrhea which is related to uterus that is called as testicular feminization syndrome which is also called androgen insensitivity syndrome. Now as you know that in testicular feminization syndrome the, the genotype is 46XY. What is the number of X, the, what is the number of chromosome in the testicular feminization syndrome? That is 46XY. As you know that if there is two X chromosome the gonads will be likely differentiated into ovary. If there is X and Y chromosome so the gonads will be likely differentiated into the testes. So in this condition there is X and Y chromosome. There is one X chromosome there will be one Y chromosome so likely the differentiated the uh, sorry the um, gonads will be differentiated into the testes. So if gonads is differentiated into testes it means they are actually males. They are actually they are actually males and they are insensitive to the testosterone they are they are insensitive to testosterone but not insensitive to estrogens now they are insensitive they are insensitive to testosterone but they are not insensitive to the estrogen and that's the reason that these uh, patients they were likely uh, presented with the secondary sexual characteristic of the females Now, as we discussed earlier that there is XY chromosome, the gonads will be likely differentiated into the testes and what is the main hormone secreted by the testes? Yes, so the two main hormones that is secreted from the testes that is testosterone 
in mullerian inhibiting factors. So the two hormone that is uh, secreted from the testes, that is, uh, that is testosterone and mullerian inhibiting factors. It means it tend to inhibit the, it tend to inhibit the uh, mullerian duct. And what is the main function of mullerian duct? It helps in the formation of fallopian tube, it helps in the formation of uterus, it also helps in the formation of upper part of vagina. So it means in this condition, the mullerian inhibiting factor, it, it is going to inhibit the mullerian duct. If mullerian duct is absent, the fallopian tube, the uterus and the upper part of vagina, their formation will be absent. So, the, so there will be uh, likely, the gonads will be likely differentiated into testes in this condition. Now, the problem is that these and these conditions, the, uh, they, they, these patients, they are insensitive to testosterone, but they are not insensitive to the estrogen. And that's the reason that these patients, they are likely presented with the secondary sexual characteristic with just like female. And that's the main issue uh, that these patients, they are presented with the appearance of the females. And what are the typical uh, manifestations of these patients? They, the typical uh, clini clinical manifestations, they are just like females, like th there is breast development. And this breast development, it is just similar, it resembles to the tenor stage 4. And the pubic and auxiliary hairs development are less in this condition. And they are resembled to the tenor stage 1 or 2. So it is important. What are the main uh, features of these patients which are similar to the uh, just like females? That is, the first one is breast development and it resembles to the tenor stage 4. While the pubic and auxiliary hair development, they are so much less and they are resembled to the tenor stage 1 and tenor stage 2. So that is all about the uh, testicular feminization syndrome, which is also called androgen insensitivity syndrome. Now, how you would manage the patient with the uh, testicular feminization syndrome? So, actually, these patients they are usually uh, presented with the 14 years. So, these uh, patients they are usually presented with the age of 14 years. So. Actually, these patients, they are presented with the age of 14 years and you have to discuss this issue with the attendants and it's a bit quite, uh, it's a bit uh, psychological trauma for them as well. So you should reassure the attendant as well and you should counsel the attendant that you should uh, raise the baby as a female. So it is important. Now, as you know that in this condition, there is an intra-abdominal testes. There is intra-abdominal testes. So if there is intra-abdominal testes, so it means it is very obvious it has a greater risk of the malignancy. So it is important that we should remove the testes. And already we are very familiar about uh, testes that it is, it is the main source for the estrogen. So if we remove the testes, so it means it is, it is a source for the estrogen. So the estrogen level will be seized. And estrogen level will be uh, start, the estrogen level will be decreases in this condition. So that's the reason the estrogen level is not adequate. So there will be menopausal symptoms appear to the patient. Like there will be heart flashes and osteoporosis and all those kind of clinical manifestations. And that's the reason the estrogen level is not so much adequate. So you can go for the ERT that is estrogen replacement therapy. So you can go for the estrogen replacement therapy and uh, you can go for vaginoplasty as well. So as it is a surgical procedure through which vagina is created. So this is a general uh, points regarding the testicular feminization syndrome. Now there are certain other important points which are associated with the testicular feminization syndrome that you should know about it quite uh, easily. Now what are those points? The first point is there's testicular, femili uh, testicular feminization syndrome, it runs in the families. It runs in the family. The second important point is that the uh, testicular feminization syndrome classification is given by Snaker. 
and that's the reason that it is termed a Snickers classification. Now, the another important point is the incomplete testicular feminization syndrome. It is called Reinstein syndrome. Now, the another important point is what is the time for the gonadectomy in these conditions? The time of gonadectomy gonadectomy is that is after puberty and which is the most specific age for it that is 16 to 18 year so the uh, testicular feminization, uh, feminization syndrome it runs in the family the testicular feminization syndrome classification it is given by sneakers that's the reason that it is called as a sneaker classification and the third point is that the incomplete testicular feminization syndrome it is called Reinstein syndrome and what is the time for the gonadectomy it is after puberty and more specifically that is from the 16 to 18 the student that's all about the first compartment of the uh, of the primary amenorrhea which is going to relate with the uterus now we will move to the other compartment the second compartment of the uh, primary amenorrhea the second compartment consists of the ovary and the ovary the most common cause of the primary amenorrhea that is called as turner syndrome now let's discuss the compartment 2 now so now in the compartment 2 what are the conditions that lead to the primary amenorrhea compartment 2 consists of ovary so what are the causes of primary amenorrhea which is related to the ovary so the first one is that is turner syndrome there is pure gonadal dysgenesis there is swear syndrome and there is Savay syndrome. Now let's discuss the Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome. Now what is the chromosome number for the Turner syndrome? So the number of chromosome in the Turner syndrome that is 45 x 0. And as you know that, that if there is two X chromosomes, the gonads will be likely differentiated into ovary. If there is one X and one Y chromosome, the gonads will be likely differentiated into testes. If there is only one X chromosome, like in this condition, so the gonads will be likely differentiated into testes or ovary. So in this condition, that is, the gonads will be also differentiated into ovary. Say if there, there is two X chromosome, gonads will be ovary if there is x y chromosome gonads will be testes if there is only x chromosome so the gonads will be also differentiated into the ovary so here there is only one x chromosome it means the gonads will be likely differentiated into the ovary but as there is only one x chromosome so the gonads will be differentiated into ovary but they are not well developed ovary so here the ovary is not well developed now look if the ovary is not well developed so it means ovary release the estrogen so if the ovary is not well developed the estrogen level is not so much high so in this condition the estrogen level will be decreases the estrogen level is not adequate and if the estrogen estrogen is responsible for the secondary sexual characteristic so in this condition the estrogen level is low so the secondary sexual characteristic and these and these patients they are not well developed now also we also know that the estrogen it helps in the growth spot already we discussed in previous videos the estrogen helps in the estrogen helps in growth spot growth spot means increase in the height so if there is low level of estrogen it means this patient has a small height so they will be likely manifested with a short structure 
so so estrogen helps in the height of the uh, height of the uh, uh, height of the individuals so if the estrogen level is decreases so ultimately the patient usually presented with the short stretcher now what is the main clinical manifestation of the turner syndrome there will be uh, wave like neck there will be wave like neck and uh, low set ears and broad chest with widely spaced nipples so there are a lot of manifestations of these patients but don't forget these manifestations it is very important so the turner syndrome patient usually presented with the wave like neck they have a low set ears they have a broad chest with widely spaced nipples so that's all about the turner syndrome how you would manage the patient with a turner syndrome now you can uh, manage the patient of turner syndrome by a that is you can give the estrogen replacement therapy estrogen replacement therapy and why we do estrogen replacement therapy the reason is the estrogen level is not adequate the estrogen level is low in these conditions so we can go for the estrogen replacement therapy and the another thing is uh, to protect against endometrial uh, hyperplasia you can go for the progesterone as well progesterone to protect against endometrial hyperplasia and usually these patient uh, they are presented with a short stretcher so you can go for the growth hormone as well so these are the treatment options for these patients you can go for estrogen replacement therapy you can go for progesterone and you can go for the growth hormone as well and the second condition is that is pure gonadal dysgenesis the chromosome number and the pure gonadal dysgenesis that is 46 xx so here the gonads are streaked there are three gonads but formation of turner syndrome is absent so here the gonads are streaked the gonads are streak but physical malformation of testes is absent so in pure gonadal dysgenesis the gonads are streak but physical malformation of testes is absent so the another condition is called as swear syndrome so what is swear syndrome the swear syndrome what is the chromosome number and the swear syndrome that is 46 x y so and uh, now let's discuss the swear syndrome what is swear syndrome swear syndrome the chromosome number and the swear syndrome that is 46 x y the genotype is 46 x y and actually it is a male counterpart it is a it is a male counterpart of turner syndrome now there are some important points to differentiate the swear syndrome from the testicular feminization syndrome how you would differentiate that that is swear syndrome and there is testicular feminization syndrome which is also called androgen insensitivity syndrome so and swear syndrome the the chromosome number is 46 xy while in testicular feminization syndrome the chromosome number is also 46 xy it means the genotype is same in both conditions the genotype is same in swear syndrome and tfs syndrome but the there the there are this the testes are dysgenic dysgenic testes what does it mean it means the testes are there but they are not working properly but in the tfs testes are there and they are working now here the anti mullerian hormone 
that is absent. In Swear syndrome, the anti-mullerian hormone is absent. While in TFS syndrome, the anti-mullerian hormone is present. So, in Swear syndrome 46, XY 46, SY, the genotype is same. There is dosgenic testes, where in TFS, the testes are there, but they are uh, working normally here the, in the Swear syndrome the AMH is negative it means they are absent while in the TFS the MH is positive. Now the secondary sexual characteristic is not well developed. Also the breast development is not fully is not fully in the condition of Swear syndrome but the secondary sexual characteristic uh, it is well developed in the TFS syndrome also the breast development is best in the TFS syndrome. So this is the just a few points uh, in order to differentiate the Swear syndrome and TFS syndrome. But the pubic hairs development that is more in the severe syndrome. The pubic hairs development is more in the Swear syndrome as compared to the TFS syndrome. So now let's repeat the uh, differentiating point of the Swear syndrome and TFS syndrome. The genotype is same 46XY, so the karyotype is same. While there is dysgenic testes, there are testes are there but they are working properly. The anti-mullerian hormone is absent in the Swear syndrome while anti-mullerian hormone is present in TFS. While the secondary sexual characteristics plus the brain development, they are not well developed in the condition of as compared to the TFS syndrome and the pubic has developed in the severe syndrome as compared to the TFS syndrome. The student that's all about the severe syndrome. While, while talking about the severe syndrome, so severe syndrome it is also called resistance ovarian syndrome. It means severe syndrome is also called resistant ovarian syndrome. Here the ovary is normal, so they have produced the estrogen, but the ovary is resistant to the estrogen. So this is the main concept here that the, uh, that the ovary is resistant to the estrogen and ultimately it leads to the primary amenorrhea. So student that's all about the compartment 2. Now let's discuss the compartment 3. In the compartment 3 it consists of the pituitary gland. So in the compartment 3 there are Compartment 3 consists of the pituitary gland. Now, what are the causes of primary amenorrhea which is related to pituitary gland? The first one is craniopharyngioma and chiri fromel syndrome. Now, what is craniopharyngioma? It is the rare type of gland tumor which is derived from the pituitary gland embryonic tissues. So, craniopharyngioma, it is a rare type of brain tumor which arises from pituitary gland embryonic tissues. Craniopharyngioma, it is more common in the children. It is more common in children. And there is a question, which kind of hormone is affected in craniopharyngioma? So the answer to the question is, that is follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So follicle stimulating hormone plus luteinizing hormone are the hormones which are getting affected in the craniopharyngioma. So how you would treat the patient with a craniopharyngioma? That is a complete rejection. Complete rejection with or without radiation therapy. So Craniopharyngioma, it is a rare type of brain tumor which is derived from the pituitary gland embryonic tissues. It is more common in the children. And 
actually which kind of hormone is getting affected in the craniopharyngioma that is follicle stimulating hormone plus luteinizing hormone how you would how you would treat the patient with the craniopharyngioma by complete resection with or without radi radiation therapy while in another hand what is cherry fromel syndrome so in the cherry fromel syndrome it occur in postpartum woman it occur in postpartum woman it means it occur in those females who has recently given the birth and cherry from a syndrome it is characterized by triangular like it is characterized by galactoria aminuria and and ovulation so cherry from syndrome it occur in postpartum woman and it is characterized by galacturia means increased breast milk production and amenorrhea that is the absence of menstruation and ovulation absence of ovulation period so these are the causes of primary amenorrhea which is related to pituitary now let's discuss the compartment 4 and the compartment 4 compartment 4 consists of the hypothalamus so compartment 4 consists of hypothalamus so what are the causes of primary amenorrhea which is associated with the hypothalamus the first one is kalman syndrome that is kalman syndrome and the another is laurin syndrome and forohlich syndrome now it is characterized by hypothalamic hypothalamic dysfunction and anosmia so Hypothalamic amenorrhea is seen in which condition? patient presented with the obesity there will be mental retardation there will be polydactyly polydactyly and there will be retinitis pigmentosa